Welcome to Women at Halftime podcast. For men and women at mid-career or the halftime of life with issues that concern you. Maximize your skills, resources, and experience to live an even more fulfilling and significant second half of life. Right here with me, Deborah Johnson on Women at Halftime podcast. Well, hello. Uh, Today is another episode of our Women at Halftime podcast. It is such a privilege to have Mike Morrell here today. It's it's really a privilege to have you, Mike. Um, We are in my office, as you can tell. Usually my husband's in here when we're doing ours once a month. But Mike is local, and he was um, a California state senator. I was, past tense. (laughs) Past tense. How does it feel now? Well, it's good to be out of Sacramento and around people like you who are normal. Yes. <laughs> um, but I miss the fight. I, I enjoy I enjoy that sort of yeah. uh, stuff trying to help our country. You know, Love that the is... the issues, yeah. That is so good to hear. And uh, Mike, you have been a friend and a colleague of ours and so kind to come in. And uh, we are going to talk about politics today yeah. without being too political. Uh, because I think some of the principles are really important. I had some really um, good questions for you. Now, I had a grandfather that was in politics. He was a mayor of a small town, and I knew how much the fight was to even get that election and and the whole thing. But you had a very, I'd like to give people, um, I'm not going to introduce this with all this sort of stuff I have going on right now, but because I really want to get right to this today. Um, What was your background, Mike, in business because you had a very successful business. Yeah, I own two real estate, or I'm sorry, two comp- California corporations. One was a real mm-hmm. estate company and another one was a lending company. Mm-hmm. And, well, actually, we actually had a third company, and it was, uh, but it was, it was within the um, real estate company. It was a property management company. Yeah, yeah. And so did that for years. And um, you decided, you know, you wanted to do something for yeah. your country. Yeah. And now, did you have to completely sell those businesses? What did you have to do? Well, a couple of things. Uh, we kept them going um, when I was up in Sacramento, mm-hmm. but it got to the point where I was working one hour a month to wow. keep my businesses going. <laughs> and they thrived for about three and a half years. And then I could see what you call key leading indicators. They were starting to go down. Yeah. Uh, but I was fortunate. I had the attorney next door. Um, come and buy uh, my office buildings at least. You wow. Know? He gave me top dollar, so it was just an appropriate thing to do. And in that way, uh, you know, we left, uh, even the last year we had, we made money, which we were fortunate, but not like we were. Yeah. You know, so it, it was a, a, you know, I don't want to say it was a sacrifice, right. um, but we did, uh, we were making better money. Yeah. Um, some people would say I gave up a lot, but I gave up nothing because God's in control and He gave me a, a, even a better. A platform to be able to help change our country. So I felt like it was a win, right. even though uh, financially, um, well, we still did okay financially. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, we were just, you yeah. know, God took care of uh, Mike and Joni Morrell real well. Oh, that's so yeah. that's so great to hear because um, when I look at politics, um, many times I think, who would want to put that target on their back? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's, well, go ahead. Do you want me to, well, there's yes. two things. <laughs> Two things you shouldn't talk about. I grew up here, uh, religion and politics. But when you mm-hmm. look at a casual study of history over the last 5,000 years, the only two ways men oppress other men and either send them into a thousand years of bondage or set them mm-hmm. free is through the two institutions of religion and politics. So they're, they're the two most important things to talk about. Wow. And so, and, and the reason I went into it is when I first uh, had my first child, Kristen Nicole, um, I was 28 years old and I started thinking about what is my purpose on life. Mm -hmm. And so it took me literally months to work this through and God gave me a scripture that one of my duties is to leave uh, from Proverbs is to leave an inheritance to my children's children. And so I thought about that is not a very high and noble Mm -hmm. thing because, you know, I'll leave them a hundred dollars each, right? Yeah. But uh, (laughs) that vision sort of grew into... Uh, it goes beyond money, but freedom of speech, freedom right. of religion, wow. uh, property rights, and, and that sort of thing. So that vision mm-hmm. sort of grew. And then as that vision grew, so did my, I started ministering 
um, outside of my work, yes. being involved with politics on different mm-hmm. boards of a hospital, on a mm-hmm. board of the YMCA to make my community better. Started a couple of Christian ministries mm-hmm. and then got involved on the business advisory board for a mm-hmm. senator mm-hmm. And, um, and just trying to do what I could to, again, leave an inheritance to my children's children. Based, That's neat. Yeah, That's uh, neat. It's our duty, you know, God, yeah. God country, and family. You know, and and I'm glad you brought this up because um, you're a man of faith. I try to be. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But um, I think so much of that drives us in the decisions that we make. And no matter what (laughs) what faith you are at or, or, or belief system is, but I think... That is really important, and I love that um, that you you said how politics. You're you're a real s- student of history too. So uh, from uh, our country's history, so and you've seen that string all the way throughout with religion and politics. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you spent seven years in high school, you'd be smart. <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, so history, history. You know, it's interesting. I wasn't. Um, interested in history at all in high school or, or college, but um, Dr. Larry Arn from Hillsdale College, who I love, history really does repeat itself. If you want to be able to see into the future, learn the past is what I've learned. And so, um, you know, I mean, there's a quote on, you know, because there's a lot of moral chaos in our country today, and um, there's a congressman from 1805 named um, what was his name? Fisher Ames. Mm-hmm. And I love what he says. He says, all of history, I like that word, how he says, all of history is open wow. for our warning, like mm-hmm. a churchyard whose solemn lessons are chiseled into the hard stone of eternity, mm-hmm. lessons that thunder to republics, your passions and your vices forbid you to be free. So when you look at those historical mm-hmm. um, um, in the past, he's right. Mm-hmm. If you look at the Old Testament, and you know, children of Israel are there yeah. <laughs> to show when they did right, they prospered as a nation. When they did wrong, you know, they were overtaken and overwhelmed and conquered right. a lot. And so, right. and so, you can right. look at history from you know even that you know the biblical perspective. But if you're not that, just look at it through the philosophers of Aristotle, Plato, mm-hmm. and Socrates, the Greek philosophers. Um, or the Roman philosophers, Cato, um, or you look at the religious community of Thomas Aquinas or Augustine, or the um, political community of John Locke and all the way from the founders, there is self-evident truth through history that you can discover through through com- um, common sense or, or discovering human nature and history, and it will lead you to the self-evident truth. And, and so the thing is, is um, again, you can kind of better understand what's going to happen in the future when you right. understand the past. And it's not because I'm so smart, but I I stand on the shoulders of those people who are wiser than me. Yes. I love Lincoln. He knew what was going on. <laughs> Churchill knew what was going on, as did, yeah. you know, Plato and yeah. Augustine. And, right. and so it's good to learn from those guys. And, right. and that's why history is so important for us to learn. Right. Um, and just to hear you expound, because we're going to talk about that self-evident truth as well. Just to hear you expound on that, it's... Um, it actually, I think, challenges us as listeners, as participants here, to know what the past is and and how how important that is in our in our educational system and, and to really understand what freedoms were really fought for and what it cost. Mm-hmm. Oh, the great cost. And you know, reading some of these biographies and, and all of that that, that uh, have gone you know through our history. And how important that is. And you quoted, uh, there's an article that come out that I put out with every single podcast as well. So I will put out an article with hopefully some of these links here so people can look them up. Um, but it, it's really important to not ignore some of these. Because I, I always thought, you know, history, my favorite part was just, you know, I had a crush on the guy in front of me and that was about it. You know, that's all I would I had. Until it started affecting my life and yeah. my freedoms. Yeah. And so that self-evident, explain that a little bit more on self-evident True. truths. Well, years ago, uh, going back to the Greeks, um, Plato and those guys said, "Is there's got to be, there, there seems to be something called truth. Mm-hmm. And today we live in a time of moral relativism, meaning mm-hmm. everybody has their own truth, 8 billion people in the world, 
uh, who can't agree on anything. You know? Right, right. And so what, what they did is, is they said that, and then it went to the religious community, and they said, well, that's because, you know, there's truth in the Bible and the scriptures. And then, you know, again, the Greeks and the Romans, well, no, you can see things in human nature that are truth. Mm -hmm. um, and even C.S. Lewis points out some, some wonderful things, you know. Mm -hmm. um, he says um, that people know God has placed mm -hmm. in the man's heart and mind the truth. Mm -hmm. He said, take a man who's never read the Bible. He has absolutely no um, concept of what the Ten Commandments are. Mm -hmm. But if he murders someone, kills someone, mm -hmm. he runs he denies it. Um, what causes him to run? Mm. Because there's something built in that he knows that's wrong, you know? Yeah. And so what happens is the founders, I love what they said, um, because today the um, our liberal side, our left side, mm -hmm. um, is telling us that the Constitution living document, meaning truth changes. So what it mm -hmm. meant 200 years ago, it doesn't mean the same today. But that document rests upon the Declaration of Independence, according to Lincoln. And in the very first paragraph, it starts off and makes the case that we're upholding to the laws of nature. Mm. And what that means is human nature and history, you can tell the truth. Mm -hmm. And it was put there by the God of nature. So it's, the phrase goes, the laws of nature and of nature's God. Mm -hmm. The very next sentence then declares, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Mm -hmm. And then if you go back to the uh, line a couple down, it says, there are we, these truths are put there with unalienable rights, meaning right. rights can never be taken away. And yeah. what are those truths? That all men are created equal, mm -hmm. to be free mm -hmm. and have life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, mm -hmm. which happiness means it comes from Christ's Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Mm -hmm. People are happiest when they pursue mm -hmm. virtue. Yeah. Like righteous is the man who thirsts, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who thirsts for righteousness, right. you know. Right. Um, happy is a man who uh, has mercy or shows mm -hmm. mercy mm -hmm. or is a peacekeeper. Those things, the attitudes, which means those are beautiful things, mm -hmm. and we want to have those type of virtues in our life. And that's yeah. what make makes us happier as well as our country. And so mm -hmm. the founders incorporated all those things in there. Mm -hmm. And again, the phrase is the laws of nature, nature's God, very first paragraph of the mm -hmm. Declaration of Independence. Yeah. And again, Lincoln says our whole constitution rest upon mm. those self-evident truths. Wow. And anytime you get out in nature, this is why I love being outdoors. And um, if I have the choice of driving somewhere, I would walk. Because, yeah. because yeah. when you see the miracle of nature, first of all, and this is self-evident that it, it, you know, things go back into the ground, um, they grow, they, you know, all of this that happens mm -hmm. through our, our cycle of that. And, and when you're talking about self-evident truths, that's included in here, mm -hmm. as well as those moral truths and about, I mean, if you've had these young kids, they know when they've done something wrong. Yeah. yeah. And they go high, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody that's had kids, you know, we've had three. I've had that experience, and it's a natural thing. And it's a natural thing to want to, you know, fight back and, and all of those. So those are sort of these in, yeah. in internal things yeah. that are through all of this. And, and it, no, you know, you just made me think of something, which I, I love this story. <laughs> Matthew was three years old, and he was up on a chair up in the cabin. And I didn't know what he was doing. But all I did is I stamped my foot behind him and yelled, Matthew. And he said, I'm not taking any cookies. <laughs> I had no idea what he was doing up there. But he confessed before he needed to confess. Because, you know, again, that's a self-evident truth that's yes. working within us, you know. Yes. Yes. And that's why, you know, people run from scenes of the crime. C.S. Lewis, his first uh, three chapters of, uh, of a mere Christianity deals with self-evident truths, you know. Right. And I love it because he says, you know, Talk to a man who's a moral relativist and say, yeah. I believe truth is whatever I think it is, and you can think whatever truth it is. Yeah. C.S. Lewis says, you can prove that man wrong within two seconds. Wow. He says, just simply steal that man's wallet, <laughs> and he's going to say, hey, what you're doing is wrong. <laughs> wow. And so, I mean, it's a great point, right? Suddenly yes, the man's going to start believing in self-evident truth. Yeah. And, but if you if he really believed that, then perhaps my truth is stealing wallets is okay. Right. Oh, yeah. But, but yeah. if you stole his wallet, you might get punched out. But yeah. but but the moral of the story is I love how C. S. Lewis puts he has about ten or twelve examples if you read those yeah. first three chapters, I think. Yeah. Um that they're just so simplistic too. And yeah. um yeah. yeah.
I, I love that simplistic part of it. And um, it's interesting because we've had so much turmoil in our nation. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate first responders. I mean, <laughs> we have the son who's a fireman. And my uncles were, I had two policemen. And we have very special, you know, close friends who are in law enforcement and all of that. And, of course, in politics. Yeah. And they are first responders. They are out there putting their lives on the line. You would... It's amazing the buildings they go into, the, the you know, and and now what's happening? It's starting to happen where people wanting to, you know, take away some of yeah. that respect from them, and now yeah. they're realizing, oh, oh, if I get broken into, I better need their help. I better, oh, 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 now it's affecting me. You know, when when you can theorize all this stuff, but when you get down to those self evidence truth, yes, there's going to be bad people in any field, period, but. <laughs> how how some of those uh, principles and and uh, were put into place is is really important for you know someone steals your wallet well are there is there a punishment for that is there repercussion for that you well know? see this is why politics we have to be involved yes. <laughs> we're the first nation governed by consent meaning uh, we give our consent how we want to be rolled over and uh, we're de destroying law enforcement. Uh, my friends across the aisle had a couple of years ago a no bail law. You don't pay any bail, wow. and you release the guy. And we released mm -hmm. tens of thousands of mm -hmm. convicted felons. And usually, if they make it to state prison, they've been arrested uh, six to eight times. I've been told at the local level, so they're not nonviolent mm -hmm. offenders. And that's yeah. why you have a lot of homeless because they want to do drugs. These yeah. guys getting out of prisons, mm -hmm. and you know, you got the smash and grab because our because politics matter. Our legislature in California, and it wasn't my, not my party, they instituted a law saying you can steal up to $950 without getting a ticket or mm -hmm. even going to jail. And so that's why you have those smash and grabs throughout. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and so the thing is, is this lawlessness mm -hmm. is increasing. Mm -hmm. But I, I do say, um, I spoke at a, 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 a Christian rock concert, right? And so oh, there's a bunch fun. of young people there. And I just <laughs> want to throw it out there and see what they thought about police. And so I praised the police. I said, we need law enforcement because we got to keep our kids and our um, honest citizens protected. And they went wild. So wow. even they know it. Wow. People, a lot of the minorities um, are the ones. If you look in L.A., um, there's a lot of murder and it's minorities killing minorities and, and mm. murders up thanks to some of those people mm. who are running that city 91% uh, over the last year. Wow. You know, homicides are up. Wow. And so um, people in the cities wow. are tired of that. There's mm -hmm. a whole movement now where people in the cities are moving to the suburbs and the right. suburb people are moving right. to rural areas because right. they're tired of that stuff. Yeah. And so the thing is, is we have to um, respect law enforcement. Um, right. Uh, the Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs, tells us that a, a wise king who wants mm -hmm. stability in his land right. will punish wrongdoers severely. Uh -huh. And so we should have tough laws and police out there. And are there going to be bad police? Of course there are. Of course. But there, Every field. there are more good police out there than there are bad. And when you hear the stories of the sacrifices yeah, that they make, sure. it's, it's really, I mean, it's... It, it's amazing. And my father was, a, um, you know, a fireman too. And it, just some of the stories and how they go into, they risk their lives and, you know, they're, they're careful, but yet you hear how they, they definitely do. And it's just, um, yeah, we need to protect our first responders. Definitely. I, I agree. So, um, well, let's get into, um, we already got into this self-evident. I mean, you were just, what I'm impressed about today is that how well you know your history and your um, how you are being able to expand, expound on some of these principles and how helpful it is even for me as I'm interviewing. I'm inspired. Um, I do not want to go into politics. I've been asked before. <laughs> it's like, but I want to do my part in what I can do to save the freedoms. If you don't guard your freedoms, they will be taken away. And we can see you know, some of this happening um, has happened and uh, and it's happening even more if we if we let that. So now you served four years, was it? Uh, well, no, um, three and a half in the assembly and six and a half in the senate. Oh wow, a lot longer. Ten oh, years. Goodness. I was there. Ten, ten years. Ten years. Yeah. Ten years. Um, I want to touch on this too, and then I want to get back to the other um, freedoms and all of this. But what was it like? to run your campaign and 
how hard was it, you know, getting elected and what sort of things did you do um, at the grassroots level? Because uh, I remember going to an event or two where you were, you were there and you were speaking and um, walking the neighborhoods and, and doing all that. My, my grandfather was a handshaker. He would well, go door to door and, and do all of that as well. What sort of things did you actively had to do, have to do to not only get into that position, but to stay in that position? Yeah. Well, those are two separate questions, and I'm mm -hmm. glad you asked that. Yeah. Um, number one, I get uh, some young people right now calling me who want to run for politics. Mm. And um, so we're in February 2nd mm -hmm. or 3rd, um, and uh, the primary is in June, mm -hmm. and they're just starting their campaigns. And I think, how foolish. So wow. I, I had a plan where I still had, I didn't want to run until my last child was out of high school. Okay. And when I decided to run, that was five years out. So wow. I started campaigning uh, under the, you know, cloak of darkness, you might say. <laughs> I joined four different chambers of commerce. Um, I got on a couple of boards. Mm -hmm. um, I would go to Toastmasters mm -hmm. and ask them, hey, I, I just want to do a speech, a political mm -hmm. speech. Would you correct me? Um, and they would correct me, so that, that helped me in my speaking, but it also got me a fan base. Right. Even there. So I would go right. to speak to anybody. So I, and then I, in my mortgage business, I had a sign to get uh, loans mm -hmm. and, and home loans and real estate, but it had my name in lights. So wow. I had it on the busiest corner in my district, right? Oh. And so, I mean, I, I really plotted and planned. And then um, 14 months out before the election, I started knocking doors. And I did it in Grand Terrace, which out of all my cities I had, that was the hilliest. Okay. And it was a summer day. It was about 90 degrees, and I walked wow. for six hours. And then I think, if I can walk six hours in 90-degree heat um, <laughs> in hills, yeah. I got this the rest of the campaign. So, so I got a lot of knocking doors, made a lot wow. of contacts, and, mm -hmm. and asked people, everybody I talked to, can I put a sign in your can wow. I put a sign? So I had... I had a lot of signs, and that right. was good advertising. The second right. thing is, how do you stay in office? Mm -hmm. right. You have to give, you, you know, there's a, um, I think it was General Schwarzkopf said, mm. um, it's better to sweat during peacetime than have to bleed during war. Uh -huh. So instead of running my campaign the last few months mm -hmm. to get elected, I yeah. started the day after I got elected by uh -huh. giving our constituents good service, showing up. Usually you send, um, um, a representative to um, when a Boy Scout gets mm -hmm. an Eagle badge, okay. yeah, I would go to almost every one of those. Oh, really? So I would try to go to every event, and then I had events that honored women, I had events that honored veterans, mm -hmm. and I had events that did also that honored businesses. So I was working mm -hmm. just to make my name known out there. Yeah, service, and then mm -hmm. uh, whenever people had a problem with EDD mm -hmm. or you know you know unemployment or whatever, yeah. I made sure my staff took care of those people instead of blowing them off because that happens a lot a lot right. of senators their staff's not that good right but we gave our people excellent service and then we st struck a deal with them um, i'm not going to say who it was but it was a big auto insurance company mm. that people over 55 if they took their two-hour class and they got a certificate from um, from the CHP mm -hmm. who did mm -hmm. the class. Mm -hmm. They could get um, unless they had a really bad driving record, a uh, <laughs> discount on their car insurance. Wow! So we we did that with yeah. thousands of seniors, right? Wow! So you build in a lot of goodwill. So wow. that's that's how you keep elected. But you're also giving them good service. Right. And you're helping to make their lives better right. too. And so it was a win for them, and it was a win for me. So smart. And, and it's really what I encourage people to do in their businesses because the main emphasis of my business is for those who are at mid-career, half time of life, or during times of change, um, through that second half of life, basically, um, how do you reinvent where you go from here? And a lot of people are looking for significance, um, for more of a meaning. They want something different. Um, they're stuck. And when you say that this five year, I mean, basically five years that you took doing all of this to do what you wanted to do. Um, I think that is such a great example for most anyone. If you even are in a place where you want a change to start planning ahead now. And I, you know, I'm a planner and how important that is because I can work remotely. There's so much freedom it gives you. You have to, 
plan ahead with all of this. And that's um, five years. I yeah. mean, what, Well, what I didn't work at 24 seven. No. I still had my other job. Oh no. But I, I would take a certain part of the day yes. five years early and start. Yeah. I just planted seeds, right? Yes. Eventually seeds are going to grow and then you harvest. Right. And when it was time to harvest, I won yeah. the campaign. And there we go, that nature principle again. Yeah. <laughs> it works, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, Self-evident truth. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that's um, a wonderful um, a way to you know plan ahead and to and when you're talking to and what a great thing that you have people asking you now too about going into politics because we do what we really need are those young bucks that you guys are smart um, and that understand what freedom is and aren't just going to go with oh well they're just telling us what to do oh well they must you know they can make all the decisions and I think that was one of my little questions for you too um, with this centralized dominating you know sort of government I mean I'm seeing all of these memes now uh, that are coming across with okay is socialism coming and where are we coming with all of these regulations and you know I I've heard that you know even in uh, China that you know with all of our COVID stuff they've nailed nailed people into their homes and into the they can't get out at all and they just want them to stay there well we have so many freedoms and so can you explain that difference here where we've got this centralized um, dominating government um, different than the collective with the individuals because those terms are something I think it it is a good thing for us to understand. Yeah, well, first of all, you always have throughout society um, mm -hmm. men who want to rule over other men and control everything. Exactly, uh, power. Yeah, and, and that's power. Mm -hmm. uh, that's sin. That's mm -hmm. wrong. Yeah. Uh, that's why you know the scriptures and history were, were warned of that. America's yeah. first nation ever had freedom, yeah. and we take it so for granted and yeah. what they fought yeah. for. Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, the founders believe that government's power should be limited. And it should be the citizens who are um, telling the governor, government what to do. The government's supposed to work for us, not mm -hmm. against us. They were meant to be our servant and not our masters. Yes. And so the thing is, we're losing today because the consent of the governed, that's in the first paragraph, Declaration of Independence, mm -hmm. we no longer give our consent. We no mm -hmm. longer are actively engaged in civic responsibility. And then the three words that the Constitution starts off at is we the people. Mm -hmm. We the people, I mean, it's kind of interesting because so many people, like um, when I was running for uh, senator and I would show up at these events, they wanted to know who the current senator was. Mm -hmm. You know, oh. remember that, you, you know, a senator is only four of them, uh, 40 of them in California mm -hmm. who makes laws regarding education, business, taxes. And so many people do not even know who their senator is. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's important that we exercise our civic responsibility mm -hmm. because that's what made us free. And so mm -hmm. we're, we the people are the ones who are losing our freedom. You yeah. also mentioned another question. What can we do? Yes. I want to say that number one thing. Uh, yeah. You want to get involved wherever you can, camp yeah. wherever you can. But the one thing we can do, mm -hmm. the most important thing, is speak out. And let me explain wow. why. Um, this politically correct speech has been around for millenniums. Mm -hmm. And it's whenever the other side, who's evil, they want to win, mm -hmm. but they know they can't win mm -hmm. on making the arguments. So they make the other side shut up by name calling and that kind of thing. Yeah. And so, again, this has been around during Churchill's time, Lincoln's time, mm -hmm. uh, all the way back even to the time of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. um, they told the disciples to shut up, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think the thing is, is words matter. Mm -hmm. We have to speak out. Churchill, uh, when uh, England was out man three to one, out uh, Air Force three to one by Hitler and as well as uh, uh, ships mm -hmm. and Navy, um, he believed they were gonna win. He was asked mm -hmm. by one of his generals why. He says, because Hitler fears us. And his aide said, mm -hmm. what could Hitler possibly fear? You know, he's got the yeah. most powerful army in the world right now. Yeah. He says, Hitler fears our word, our words. Mm -hmm. And see, most despots and mm -hmm. people who are dictators and mm -hmm. who are evil, they don't want us to speak out. You see? And so that's why we've got to shut down mm -hmm. and push back on this social media, these guys yeah. that are cutting our spot, our, our speaking off right. because they don't like because see, we can win the argument. And that's why mm. us citizens, we have to speak out to our neighbors, mm. to our friends. Mm. The worst thing we can do is be silent. Yeah, wow. Yeah. 
That and that's scary. And you don't want to lose. Don't yeah. worry about losing friends either. And you know what? You don't. Yeah, you can't worry about losing friends. Um, and I think because there's been so much control with all of that. Um, but you know, it's interesting because uh, my husband Greg and I talked about this this morning, and he said the best antidote to all of this is. You know, when people are, you know, complaining about, you know, certain social media uh, channels, just give some incentives for everybody. You know, this is a free country. So if you're going to give tax breaks to an organization like Facebook or the others, well, make that sort of universal. Let the competition rise. And and so there is place and we are seeing this all over the place now to where People can feel like they can, they have a platform. That's why podcasts are huge right now. Podcasts are huge because people have had now the freedom to be able to speak out and to speak their, um, their opinions. And, and I think we've, we're coming from places where, well, I don't want to say too much or I don't want to, oh, I don't want people to think I'm divisive or I'm, you know, or I'm too much That's this what way. Or, they don't want you. They, yeah, exactly. they want you to think that. But remember, yeah. we're fighting for freedom. Yes. We're fighting for our children and our yeah. children's children. Yes. We are on, uh, I love Dr. Larry Arn from Hillsdale College, okay. president of Hillsdale College. Mm-hmm. And he says we are right where we were in 1860, mm. wow. right before the Civil War. Mm-hmm. And we are in the third great American crisis. Wow. And whether or not America is going to survive or come into a tyrannical mm-hmm. government mm-hmm. ruled by force mm-hmm. with an aggressive hostility towards mm-hmm. the free markets wow. as well as people of faith. Right. And so we are in a war. Yeah. And I really want to emphasize here, um, because this is faith of all faiths. This is not just a, um, a deep Christian faith, too. Because if you shut down a Christian faith, you've shut down every other faith. Uh, you've shut down any, the Jewish faith. You've shut down the people's ability to believe what they want to believe in whatever country they are from and whatever background they are from. But that's where we have this freedom in this country. We don't have the freedom to to use that faith for fighting, but we have the freedom to believe well and to worship how we want to worship. And and that's that's that that what the Declaration of Independence gave us. Except for churches that wanted to worship. Yeah. Uh, there was Calvary Chapel up in Mm-hmm. San Jose, they got fined one point seven million dollars, I believe. Wow! You know, so I mean, uh, yeah. So you know, I'm not going to go into the mask or versus this or yeah. that, but um, yeah. but you know, they're telling churches mm-hmm. what to do and not what to do. So our our mm-hmm. our freedoms are you yeah. Know, they, they they are at stake. They hang yeah. they hang yeah. in the balance. And but I've seen some of those also fight back yeah. successfully, mm-hmm. and so. You know, you start drawing those lines, um, but really they are fighting for all freedoms there. You're not just fighting for religious freedom. You are fighting for all, all freedom. I, that's the way I am interpreting a lot of this, because what you do is, is if you win that fight, you have won it for, it's like a, an attorney's, I mean, you have a son who's an attorney. I have a son who's an attorney. They go by what these pasts um, records are and mm-hmm. that's how they base their current decisions many times and what those are and what they're based upon so you know you come up against a wall you know you get a dog that's trapped or an animal that's trapped they're going to fight back yeah. and we're seeing some of those fight back now and uh, not being afraid to do that so well do you have something else to leave because I, I love this is to get involved and to speak out and not to be afraid of that I tell you, but I have even struggled with, okay, so how much should I say? How much should I share? But I'm actually, I'm getting bolder. Yeah, that's <laughs> because good. I'm that's going good. along, I'm getting bolder. Um, and, I, you know, there's certain, because I have a lot of artists, and, you know, sometimes, okay, I don't want to, like, really push people and, you know, all of this. And, and, I, and there's certain areas where I just have to be, you know, compliant with all of the certain things in my life that, okay, so I, I want to work and I want to do all these things, but in travel. Um, but what else can you leave um, our audience of, of action points that they can actually do to make a difference? I have two action points. Today. Okay, that'd and be I'd great. I'd like to read both of them if I could. You can. So there was a gentleman <laughs> named Alexis de mm-hmm. who worked for the, he was a Frenchman and the French government 
sent him to America in the early 1800s to discern our greatness. And mm -hmm. so he traveled every corner of what was America then. And mm -hmm. it's a book, he put all his findings in a 700 page book and the title is Democracy in America. But I found a couple of paragraphs here that sums up really what I think the whole book is and why America was great. So I'd like to read that and then I'll give you advice on that one. Perfect. Um, so Tocqueville said this and he said, I have sought for the greatness and genius of America in her rich harbors and her ample rivers. And it was not there. And her fertile fields um, and boundless forests, and it was not there. Mm -hmm. I searched in her rich mines and her vast commerce, and it was not there. In her democratic congress, it was not there. Mm -hmm. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. Mm -hmm. America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. Key last sentence here. Mm -hmm. But if the pulpits are no longer aflame with righteousness, mm -hmm. could it be that the people will no longer know the truth? And so one thing I want you to know mm -hmm. is a lot of churches have become what I call user-friendly, mm -hmm. seeker-sensitive. Mm -hmm. And it's killing us. Now, mm -hmm. the good news is, is in the last six years, I've been fortunate to speak to pastors all over the country at different conferences, and I've probably spoken to 12, 13,000 pastors. Wow. And they're finally realizing they're in trouble. Wow. Interesting. Okay, so we have to pray for our pastors, mm -hmm. and we have to encourage them to get involved. Yeah. Based on what mm -hmm. that 700-page book of Democracy America says. Wow. That's, that's, that's the great. first thing we can do is we can encourage great. them to get involved. Mm -hmm. Second thing, I'll just close with this, because uh, I like Churchill. Yeah. You know, that if you remember, the London Blitz was eight months, and there was a point in the London Blitz where London was being uh, bombed 57 consecutive nights in a row. So things were very dark back then. Mm -hmm. They were more dark then than they were today. Imagine mm -hmm. if L.A. or New York's being bombed 57 yeah. consecutive yeah. nights. Um, we would not like that. And so right. uh, Churchill's just, no wonder he was so great. So here's what he says to the British people. And I leave you with this thought because I think we can apply it to today and what we need to do. So let me close with uh, Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. He says, our future and that of many generations is at stake. We are sure that the character of human society will be shaped by the resolves we take and the deeds we do. Mm -hmm. We need not be well the fact that we have been called upon to face such a solemn responsibilities. We may be proud and even rejoice amidst our tribulations that we have been born at this cardinal time for so great an age and so splendid an opportunity of service here below. Wow. Thank wow. you. Wow. Wow. So. That, very inspiring. And uh, when we um, read, of course, or, or watched, I think it's The Darkest Hour, his, the movie, it, yeah. it brought it, because I'm so involved with, you know, I'm very visual and being able to see the angst in those decisions and how hard it was to make those decisions. And I think for many today, these are hard decisions because we're saying, okay, I might lose friends. I might lose, you know, followers. I might lose all of this. You know, am I going to ostracize people? But those people may not matter in the long run. And, well, let me tell you, you know? it, it, here's my concern. Things, <laughs> I believe there's hope for America. I do, I do, I do too. Do. I but, definitely do. But I am convinced things are going to get worse before they get better. Mm. Because mm. people still need to realize what's going on. They need yeah. to stand up and fight for their family and their yeah. country and their children. Right. And so we do have rough seas ahead. Yeah. But yeah. I think at the end of the day, I believe we will prevail. Yes. Hope. It's kind of the part of the message of the summit yeah. of, of, you know, the band of hope that the character has to wear. She can't get to her summit without that. And it's a real visual for what we all have to have. We have to hang on to that hope with everything and what that is based in. And of course, I have a very strong faith and that hope is based on my strong faith too. And and I, and I think that's a really important um, part of your life. And that's just exciting for what you have done. And I, I think such an example for those that are watching, that are listening, 
that you planned ahead for this at this point in at this point in your life and you're missing the fight. Wow. I want to know what's next for you. So <laughs> you may not know <laughs> totally, although you might have a plan, but um, but you planned ahead to be able to serve our country in this way. So, well, any last words? And I'm going to kind of close this off. And this was an amazing last word that you gave us. But no, I'm just grateful you had me on. I, I hope I I hope I uh, maybe some. Yeah. Imparted a little bit of wisdom. Yeah. I tell people, whatever I say, just do the opposite and you'll be successful. So <laughs> no, I'll just leave it at that. I don't think so. I don't think so. I think you've probably inspired people and inspired me in many ways of, you know, doing my research and looking back yeah. and to see, like, the history repeats itself, what really was involved and is involved. Um, and I think that's so very valuable in... Um, really the future and, and the future of our country and with our children, our grandchildren and what we want them to grow up in. And I know you've got, you know, both as well as we do and, you know, and, and what we have in our, in our country. So anyway, Amen. Well, thank just, you, Debbie. yeah, it's just yeah. been wonderful. Um, and again, I, I encourage everyone to connect with me online as well in all my social media. You can see uh, women at halftime.com and you'll see all of the episodes there, but also the other websites that we will link to get on the newsletter, which is goalsforyourlife.com forward slash newsletter. And you'll get articles every week as well. And they will have all of these weekly podcasts in it. And and join us every week with a new uh, a new show, a new episode. So thanks again, Mike, for being with us Thank today. You. Uh-huh. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. It is because of our wonderful listeners like you that we keep going strong week after week. Share and follow us for new shows to inspire you and encourage you in your life's journey. You can find all of our articles and links at womenathalftime.com.